Hi, good evening everyone. So we'll be continuing our lectures on single drug or one drug every week. And last week we discussed uh, Dapson. And this week we'll be discussing another one of the important drugs in dermatology as far as leprosy is concerned. It's one of the major anti-Hansen drugs, anti-leprosy drugs. It's a very important part of multi-drug regimen in leprosy. So we'll be having an overview about, about rifampicin in dermatology. It's mechanism of action, how does it act, uh, what are the side effects, interactions of this drug. So we'll be discussing that in detail. I won't be discussing much about its use in leprosy per se because that's in a different uh, topic altogether. But we'll be discussing about uh, usage of rifampicin in leprosy, cutaneous tuberculosis, any other dermatological indications and uh, the how it has its uh, bactericidal effects and what are the side effects and interactions associated with rifampicin therapy okay so with that being said we can start with rifampicin in dermatology okay and uh, before we go forward just remember that this class of drug which are actually known as rifamycins rifamycins they have predominantly four drugs one is rifampin okay now rifampin is also known as rifampicin so there is no confusion about it next is rifabutin okay rifabutin then you have rifapentin and then in finally you have rifaximin let me just write it again Rifaximin, okay, and in this video, we'll be discussing only about the rifampin part, not the other rifamycins, okay. But uh, when we'll be discussing about alternative drug regimens for leprosy in maybe some other future video, then we can discuss a bit about the differences between these different types of rifamycins, okay. So, this lecture would only uh, focus on rifampin and rifampicin. Clear? Let's move forward. So the story starts in the year 1957 in the country of Italy where a soil sample was being analyzed regarding its antibacterial properties and the organism that was isolated from that soil sample is this organism Mycolatopsis rifamycinica. The older name for this organism is Streptomyces. Let me just write, write it for you. Streptomyces mediterranei. Mediterranean. Mediterranean. So, oh, people who are interested in quizzing can remember this older name for a mycolatopsis rifamycinica. Let's move forward. So, the, and they are part of the group known as rifamycin and the word rifa comes from rififi which is a french crime story and the isolators of this organisms really loved this french crime story so they decided to name this newer class of drugs uh, on the on the basis of rififi so that's why they're known as rifamycin in 1965 the drug rifampin or rifampicin was isolated and since it has a much better action against the bacterium this became the prototype drug of this class in 1971, rifampicin got FDA approval for the treatment of various conditions and rifampicin is also a part of WHO's list of essential medicines and it is also a part of critically important medicines for human population. Okay. It is available as generic medication in a lot of countries. It is easily available as a generic med medication. Even for some indications, it has got the title of an orphan drug. Uh, there are many indications, some rarer indications in which rifamycins are used and for that reason we get it very cheaply and if you remember while giving MDT therapy in your OPDs, you will find those blister packs coming from WHO, they are easily and freely available and supplied to the institutions for treatment of leprosy. Okay, so it's a part of essential medications, it's a part of critically important medication for human population. 
Let's discuss pharmacology of rifampicin. It's a red brown crystalline powder which is highly lipid soluble and only slightly soluble in water. Okay, so it's very highly lipid soluble and it's a red brown crystalline powder. Okay, so remember that uh, all of the anti leprosy drugs have some relation to color. So, Dapson, in the last video, we learned that it was actually a dye product as, was, because, as a result of uh, trying to find out dyes. And even if ampicin is a very colorful compound, it has good absorption from the gut, and the availability is actually reduced by 30%. Some articles mention 36%, 30 to 36% reduction with food. Okay, so what happens is when rifampicin, when it, it is absorbed from the GI tract, it gets hydrolyzed in the liver and then excreted in the bile. Okay. And after that, after secretion, uh, let's say about six hours after intake of rifampicin, the drug gets deacetylated. But even this deacetylated form of rifampicin has a strong antimicrobial action, and because of uh, <coughs> sorry, and because of that, the deacetylation product is not readily absorbed from intestine. Okay, so let me repeat: when you take rifampicin through your mouth, it goes into your intestine, it gets absorbed, goes to your liver gets excreted in bile where it is deacetylated. The deacetylated product is also bac bactericidal but it is not absorbed by the intestine as rifampicin is, uh, is absorbed. Okay. So what happens is there is a significant enterohepatic circulation to some extent but repeated doses of rifampicin will lead to decrease the absorption even decreasing the half-life of the drug also because of this mechanism. So about uh, because of that 65% of the drug is excreted in feces because it is not absorbed eventually through the intestinal mucosa. So 65% of the drug is excreted in the feces while roughly about 30% is excreted by the kidneys. So just, just as I said, enterohepatic circulation leads to deacetylation and deacetylated rifampicin is not readily absorbed through intestine and thus 65% of the drug is excreted with bile, 30% with through kidneys. The bioavailability is high about 90 to 95 percent after a single dose of rifampicin. 80 percent of the drug is protein bound and half-life is roughly about 3 to 4 hours but it can be reduced to around 1 to 3 hours after repeated administration. So by the same mechanism, the deacetylation mechanism, the half-life may reduce with subsequent uh, dosages but in case of Hansen's, in case of leprosy where we give months and month dose, the half-life is roughly about 3 to 4 hours or 3.3 to 4 hours. Clear? So let's move forward. Now, how does rifampicin act? The main, the major mechanism of action is inhibition of DNA dependent RNA polymerase. So remember that this uh, cell has DNA, the DNA strands are separated, and then using this DNA strand as a, uh, what you can say, the DNA strand as a scaffold or as a stencil and RNA is made. Okay, so let me just change the color. So using this DNA strand as a scaffold and RNA is made and this reaction or this process is done by DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Now this enzyme is inhibited by rifampicin and thus the, uh, the RNA synthesis does not take place. Clear? Now the, the good thing about rifampicin is that it only inhibits the bacterial uh, bacterial DNA dependent RNA polymerase. It has no action on mammalian DNA dependent RNA polymerase. So there is no action on mammalian RNA polymerase enzyme and that is why it, it damages specifically the bacteria which is infecting the human body. It acts by a steric occlusion mechanism. That means, let me just erase everything. So if you have DNA dependent RNA polymerase and let's say this is the active site where rifampicin would bind. When rifampicin binds to the active site because of binding of rifampicin, RNA polymerase is not able to attach itself to the DNA, poly uh, DNA strand or it is not able to, uh, able to incorporate more nucleosides and nucleotides while making RNA. And because of the uh, inability of polymerase to attach more base pairs, the, uh, the elongation of the chain doesn't go beyond two to three nucleotides. 
okay so after every two to three nucleotide the chain breaks and because of that a new dna dependent rna is not able to form in the bacterial uh, cell uh, cell and the cell doesn't multiply and there is bactericidal effect so this active site is known as the beta subunit okay so where does the fampicin attaches itself it attaches itself to the beta subunit of rna polymerase clear so binds to the pocket of rna polymerase beta subunit no action mammalian rna polymerase so this is the bactericidal mechanism of action of the fampicin another major action is the upregulation of microsomal enzymes of the cytochrome p3a family so this upregulation of cytochrome enzymes and because of this upregulation of cytochrome enzymes bile salts are increasing increasingly uh, increased hydroxylation of bile salts appear so when bile salts they get accumulated into the circulation it leads to cholestatic itching it leads to cholé means bile static means accumulation increasing increasing quantity pruritus okay so normally uh, how does rifampicin help in cholestatic pruritus is that it increases the uh, upregulation of microsomal enzymes and these enzymes then hydroxylate the bile acids and hydroxylated bile acids are not absorbed through the ileum they get excreted out of the body and slowly and slowly the amount of bile salts are reduced and that is why rifampicin is one of the drugs used to treat cholestatic pruritus clear let's move forward since in the last slide we discuss about mechanism of action of rifampicin we'll discuss in short about mechanism of resistance so like i said in the last slide that you have rna polymerase and then you have the beta part of rna polymerase or the beta subunit this is the binding side of rifampicin binding side of rifampicin if there are any altered residues at the binding side that means the area or the amino acid sequence which acts as the attachment site of rifampicin if that site is altered the rifampicin will not be able to attach itself to rna polymerase and thus rifampicin will not be able to act like an bactericidal compound and this leads to resistance clear now this beta subunit is encoded by a gene which is known as rp smaller rpo bg or how do you remember it rna polymerase beta subunit okay so rpo gene now this rpo gene it encodes for the beta subunit of rna polymerase and if there is a mutation in the rpo b gene most likely the changes in base pairs leucine acylleucine translocation there are many uh, foci of mutations have been reported if there are any mutation in the rpo b gene the beta subunit is not proper and because of improper beta subunit the fampicin does not get attached to the rna polymerase and it doesn't act clear additionally in mycobacterium tuberculosis this rrdr is a segment which exists okay now rrdr is a part of the rpo beta gene in which maximum mutations have been reported if i am not wrong roughly about 96% of cases of rifampicin resistance have a mutation in the rrdr portion of the rpo b gene and what is rrdr rrdr is rifampicin resistance determining region okay so about 96% mutations are in this 96% of cases of resistant tuberculosis have a mutation sorry resistant to rifampicin have a mutation in the rrdr segment the rest 4% the mechanism is unknown one alternative mechanism is arr catalyzed adp ribosylation of rifampicin in this what happens is rifampicin structure is changed by addition of arr molecules now what is arr i tried to find out i couldn't find what is arr theek okay. hai but uh, one reference that i could find is adp adp ribose molecules residues okay adp let me just write it write everything 
ARR is ADP ribose residues. So there is a certain enzyme in uh, Mycobacterium smegmatis that attaches ARR residues to rifampicin, thus altering the structure of rifampicin, and then rifampicin is not able to attach itself to the RPO beta, sorry, to the beta subunit of RNA polymerase. And that is one of the alternative mechanism in M smegmatis. Clear? So you have mutation in RPOB gene, you have mutation in, in RRDR segment of RPOB gene in mycobacterium tuberculosis, and you have increased ADP ribose residue attachment to rifampicin in mycobacterium uh, smegmatis. Clear? Let's move forward. <clears throat> now, this segment is somewhat new to me. I have no idea that uh, rifampicin has a significant anti-inflammatory effect. So most of the studies have been done in vitro. In vivo studies are still isolated and uh, there are only few case reports about in vivo effects, anti-inflammatory effects of rifampicin. Now I just, uh, I, I just have to point to two references. I'll provide the link to these references in the description of this video in which you can read in detail about the anti-inflammatory effects of rifampicin. Clear? So uh, how does rifampicin act as an immune suppressing Drug. It leads to reduction of toll like receptor 2. It also inhibits LPS, which is lipopolysaccharide. LPS induces inflammatory secretion. It also leads to isolated NFK beta reduction. And if you have gone through my videos on uh, non steroidal immunosuppressives, you know that NFK beta is the central molecule or the central, central uh, you could say, messenger which promotes translation of inflammatory cytokines okay so what you you have a dna element dna a part of this is dre which is dna response element nfk beta attaches itself to dre and this leads to translation of inflammatory cytokines so when nfk beta is reduced by rifampicin subsequently downstream uh, the inflammatory cytokines will be decreased and with the similar mechanism, it decreases the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So if you want to go in detail about how does rifampicin acts as an immunosuppressive or an immune immunoregulatory action, go and go through these two references and you will find a good explanation, detailed explanation about what are the anti-inflammatory effects of rifampicin. Now this reference, this uh, bar graph I have taken from this reference, so you can see uh, see that in subsequent increasing concentration of rifamycin, there is increased reduction in the cytokines. This is inhibition cytokine. That means the amount of percentage of inhibition of cytokine increases with the increasing doses of rifampicin. That means the more rifampicin is there in the system, more is the reduction of cytokine. So you could you could see that TNF alpha, very important inflammatory cytokine, interleukin eight interleukin 2, interleukin 17, interferon gamma, interleukin 6, these are all inflammatory cytokines. And with increasing doses of rifampicin, you can see that the percentage inhibition also increases. So this is the uh, bar graph from the same reference that I have cited. It's, it will be available in the description box. You can go and read the full article and you will read about the anti-inflammatory effects of rifampicin. So we use rifampicin not majorly for its anti-inflammatory effect. We use it more of as an antimicrobial agent. Okay, it has a very broad spectrum of activity. For example, it was started as an antibacterial agent against Staphylococcus. So it works on gram-positive bacteria. Okay, so it acts against Staphylococcus, both coagulus negative, coagulus positive. Other important indications: mycobacterium species, and this. Right now, uh, presently, is the major indication for rifampicin. So it works against mycobacteria, which includes your tuberculosis and leprosy, two major mycobacteria that we use rifampicin for. Other organisms like Neisseria meningitidis, Neisseria gonorrhoeae, H. influenza, Haemophilus influenza, so it acts against gram negative also. But gram negative coverage is poor. So it's a, it has a good action against the gram positive bacteria. Clear? 
Several chlamydia species are also known to be affected by the bactericidal action of rifampicin. Addition to that, there have been, uh, for example, you use uh, rifampicin for actinomycetomas also. So there's a very uh, broad spectrum of organisms that can be killed by using rifampicin. We majorly use as dermatologists as, as because of its action against M. leprae or for treating cutaneous tuberculosis or for treating uh, staphylococcal infections as, as in a combination therapy for uh, folliculitis decalvans or recurrent folliculitis or even as a therapy for heterodynitis separativa. We'll discuss them a little bit in detail while we'll, we'll be discussing its individual uses. So let's begin with, with the use of rifampicin in mycobacteria. Now remember that rifampicin is a very important and a very good bactericidal drug. It's very effective also. Okay. But the major problem that we face with the use of rifampicin, especially in our country, is resistance. I found a reference that 10 raised to the power minus 8 to 10 raised to the power minus 9, minus 9, bacterium per cell division is the resistance rate for rifampicin. That means for every 10 raised to the power 8 to 9, uh, 9 uh, cell divisions, you will have one bacteria which is resistant or for every 10 raised to the power 8 to 10 raised to the power 9 bacterium, when they undergo one cell division, there will be one resistance, uh, resistant organism to rifampicin. This may look like a very small magnitude, but in the grand scheme of things in which the bacteria is dividing a lot in your body, the amount of uh, organisms which may end up resistant to rifampicin is very high. So it is always recommended that you use rifampicin in combination with other bactericidal or other antibacterial agents. The uses against mycobacterium species is predominantly for tuberculosis and cutaneous tuberculosis, leprosy and also as a prophylaxis for uh, uh, or a suppressive regimen for latent tuberculosis, as a prophylaxis for latent tuberculosis. One more thing that we can add is single drug regimen in leprosy patients, not leprosy patients, contact of leprosy patients. So in patients who have been in contact with a with diagnosed case of leprosy, we give single drug rifampicin as a prophylaxis for leprosy disease, against leprosy disease. It is most bactericidal drug against M. leprae, but it loses effectiveness after about 6 months. So there have been studies which show that uh, after 6 months the bactericidal effect is somewhat dampened. That is why I think the WHO is recommending 3 drug regimen for both types of leprosy. Other mycobacterium species like MAC, com MAC complex, which is mycobacterium avium complex, and also in, in which is mostly seen in HIV AIDS patients who have CD4 counts less than 15 per microliter. So in retropositive patients where the CD4 count is less than 50 per microliter, it acts as a very good preventive agent and also as a uh, as a treatment agent for a typical mycobacterium infection, including MACs. So these are all the mycobacterium species against which rifampicin is used. In fact, for this indication, rifabutin rifabutin was given an orphan drug status, orphan drug status by FDA. So what is orphan drug? That means there there are drugs which are used to treat diseases which are so rare that companies might not manufacture those drugs anymore okay so if a disease is so rare that the treatment is not that profitable so the company doesn't make it if you give a status of orphan drug to that drug companies have to manufacture a certain amount every time or every year so that the drug supply is always maintained for that rare disease so that is the concept of orphan drug so uh, we will spend a little bit of time in, in going through the use of rifampicin in mycobacterium leprae or for the treatment of uh, leprosy. The dose which is given by WHO is 600 mg a month. So that's the WHO guideline. The newer guidelines for the past at least 3 to 4 years, it is 3 drugs for 6 months, 6 months for PB 
12 month for mb leprosy okay so this is the uh, regimen which has to be given as per who all three drugs the fampicin dapson clofazamine 6 months for pb and 12 months for mb if the patient is resistant to rifampicin at least two second line drugs which are clarithromycin minocycline or a quinolone which can be ofloxacin levofloxacin moxifloxacin plus daily clofazamine for 6 months so this is the induction phase of leprosy so if a patient of leprosy who is resistant to rifampicin you have to start two second line drugs which can be from clarithromycin minocycline or a quinolone and additionally clofazamine daily for 6 months this will be followed by clofazamine by one of, plus one of these two drugs so uh, i know it's sounding very confusing and i will make a separate video on alternative drug th therapy for leprosy but if your patient is resistant to rifampicin you will start either clarithromycin or minocycline or a quinolone okay choose any two drugs from these three classes any two drugs plus clofazamine this will go for 6 months and after 6 months it will be one of these drugs the two drugs that you have chosen one of these drug plus clofazamine for 18 months clear somewhat clearer and additionally in leprosy i have said that you give as a single dose rifampicin every month to the contacts of the index case okay the doses is so let let me just uh, tell you the dosage changes regarding the age for adult patient it is 600 mg a month if it's between 10 to 14 years it's 450 mg a month 450 mg let me just write For ten to fourteen years, it is four fifty milligram, and the pediatric dosages is ten to fifteen milligram per kg per month. Okay, so six hundred milligram a month for adults. If it's less than ten, if it's between ten to fourteen years, it's four fifty milligram. If it is pediatric doses, is ten to fifteen milligram per kg per month. there are also further indication for pediatric age group from 6 to 9 years we'll be discussing that in the next slide and we'll be discussing the the treatment of leprosy when the fampicin resistance is present in detail by uh, when we'll be discussing about alternative drug treatment for leprosy so the uh, these are the uh, these are the drug modifications or the dosing modifications as per the age 15 years and above it is 600 mg a month for 10 to 14 years it is 450 mg a month for 6 to 9 years if the weight is more than 20 kg it is 300 mg a month and for pediatric doses 10 to 15 mg per kg a month which we have already discussed okay so this this dosages i'll just remove all the markings so that if anybody of you want to take a screenshot they can take so these are the dosage dose regimens or dose changes for rifampicin as per the age similarly this and let me just tilt my camera a bit different okay so this table is going to tell you about the use of other drugs in rifampicin resistance so as we have said it is ofloxacin which is a which is a quinolone minocycline which is one of the second line drugs and clofazamine for 6 months followed by either quinolone or minocycline plus clofazamine for 18 months clear so there are other regimens also i am not deliberately going into details right now i will discuss them when i will make a video on alternative drug therapies in uh, hansons because in leprosy we all know about clofazamine dapson rifampicin but we don't know what to do when patient is resistant to it or by some other reason they cannot take this medication okay let's say for example your patient has significant liver failure liver cirrhosis you cannot give rifampicin then what so we will discuss that when we will be discussing alternative drug therapies in leprosy but right now i'll i'll just again 
remove all the markings so that if any of you would like to take a screenshot you can take a screenshot of this part and keep it with you as notes regarding alternative drug treatments instead of refactors okay so let's move forward let me switch my camera so majorly in, in our indication we use it left right and center for leprosy but what are the other indications what are the other infections in which you can use rifampicin so other infections like bartonella henselii which causes your cat scratch disease cat scratch disease it also causes bacillary angiomatosis you can use rifampicin there but remember monotherapy with rifampicin is a strict no no even while do, while dealing with folliculitis it cannot be given as a monotherapy it will lead to resistance and that will be a big problem in our country who is dealing with tuberculosis and leprosy so please do not use rifampicin as an isolated only drug other indications are methicillin sensitive staph aureus there are also few indications of uh, use of rifampicin in methicillin resistant staph aureus but it has been significantly shown to be beneficial in methicillin sensitive staph aureus as a prophylaxis for meningococci and as a prophylaxis a prophylaxis for hemophilus influenzae other somewhat non infective conditions or inflammatory conditions in which there are isolated case reports are hydrodynatis separativa granuloma annulare folliculitis decalvans and even in recurrent folliculitis you may give rifampicin now one of the case one of the articles that we were previously discussing regarding the antibacterial uh, sorry anti inflammatory effects of rifampicin details its use in hydrodynatis separativa so i request you all to go to the individual article and read go through it read it so that you would know uh, how how effective or how does rifampicin acts as a immuno regulatory drug contraindications of rifampicin include any hypersensitivity to rifampicin or let's say a severe drug reaction to rifampicin if it has occurred before we uh, i have personally seen cases as dress syndrome with rifampicin sgstn with rifampicin severe lichenoid eruption to rifampicin so in those cat in those scenarios in those uh, patients you may have to be very very careful to by using rifampicin It, it can be regarded as a contraindication for its use. There are no box warnings, but there are certain precautions which we have to take. So uh, let me just highlight only the precaution part, the hepatic one, because it has it can cause potentially severe hepatotoxic as a rare outcome. Be mindful when you are using it in a patient who don't have a good functioning liver. So if a patient is let's say uh, suffering suffers from alcoholism, you may not be able to use it. or a post liver transplant patient either a donor or a recipient you might not want to use rifampicin so if baseline lfts are not let me just change it so if baseline lfts are not normal you can you should not use rifampicin hypersensitivity reaction like i said dress has been reported so make sure that in patient who have a history of dress or sgst en with rifampicin you should not use rifampicin. now endocrine rifampicin has a uh, it has a very uh, important aspect to it because it has a lot of drug interaction and that is majorly because of upregulation of liver enzymes and like uh, mainly cytochrome p3a uh, group of enzymes and because of that the hypoglycemic drugs are increasingly metabolized by this enzyme so if you give rifampicin the metabolism of anti uh, anti diabetic drugs will increase and will lead to alteration in blood sugars okay similarly enzyme induction of endogenous hormones also take place so the hormones which are naturally produced in the body will go to liver and degrade and that is their normal life cycle but if if you give rifampicin this degradation will increase a lot and there will be insufficiency of these endogenous hormones the insufficiency could be as severe to cause an adrenal crisis it can be as severe to cause hypothyroidism it also decreases the vitamin d metabolism 
and because of that the, sorry it uh, decrease it increases the metabolism of vitamin d and that leads to decreased vitamin d levels also porphyria exacerbation remember that uh, it can exacerbate episodes of acute intermittent porphyria because of enzyme reduction of delta amino levulinic acid synthetase okay so delta amino levulinic acid synthetase is an enzyme and this enzyme is induced this enzyme is induced by rifampicin and this can precipitate an attack of attack of acute intermittent porphyria clear additionally pct porphyria cutanea tarda can also happen when liver damage is severe by rifampicin okay regarding pregnancy category the older category is category c the exception to that is rifabutin rifabutin is category b so b for butin category b clear so it's pregnancy category c the newer category as we all know that after 2015 the fda has changed its uh, labeling uh, criteria the newer rating is probably compatible probably compatible okay so older category c newer category probably compatible they have been okay so let me just add something to it rifampin is not a teratogen so there have been instances when mothers have got pregnant while taking rifampicin and it is not to be found not to uh, not to cause any abnormalities it has also been found in breast milk so much so that there are isolated case reports of having hemolysis because of rifampicin in newborn over on breast milk so this uh, rifampicin is secreted into the breast milk but whether that secretion leads to clinically significant side effect we just have to decide that on a case to case basis so remember that the newer rating is probably compatible In the previous slide, we have discussed about contraindications and pregnancy category. Now we will discuss about adverse effects of uh, rifampicin. So remember that rifampicin has an intensely red color. It's a red brown powder, and this leads to red discoloration of bodily secretions. So there is red discoloration of bodily secretions. That means your urine will turn red orange. Urine. Uh, breast milk sweat semen tears all of these bodily secretions will turn orange okay so this is one of those side effects that you should tell your patient before giving rifampicin that uh, they should be mindful of these changes otherwise it may lead to non compliance or patient not taking the drug because they might think that they are bleeding in, in their urine or there's any blood uh, coming out from uh, there's a bloody urine so they might stop taking rifampicin so you need to tell them okay and coming from somebody who have themselves taken rifampicin for at least 16 months every day this color is very stark it's very bright you will not drink fanta if you have if you take rifampicin now cns symptoms include headache drowsiness ataxia dizziness inability to concentrate and also fatigue okay remember that rifampicin is very readily rifampicin is readily absorbed through gut and it has a very high penetrative value that means rifampicin goes inside each and every cell system it also goes to the brain too so that is why you have cns symptoms gastrointestinal symptoms include epigastric distress nausea vomiting diarrhea and every of each one of these side effects can start from the first dose itself okay the nausea and vomiting it may not happen to everyone but if it happens to one of your patient it is severe enough severe enough to cause intense abdominal cramps or extreme loss of appetite significant epigastric burning sensation uh, even with a single dose okay so most of us will prescribe ppis remember that ppis decrease the absorption of rifampicin so if you want to give rifampicin along with ppi one advice is to give rifampicin 
wait for one hour give ppi wait for half an hour and then have a big have breakfast have a good breakfast so this would help in good absorption of rifampicin if you want to give proton pump inhibitor which okay remember that food also decreases the absorption of rifampicin from 30 36% so it's always given early in the morning empty stomach and if it is causing significant gastritis give ppi one hour after rifampicin intake okay you can even give emset for vomiting and uh, subsequently if you take multiple dosages the side effects do get better immunological side effects occur because of rifampicin rifampicin auto antibodies so rifampicin does lead to induction of auto antibodies or anti drug antibodies uh, against rifampicin and the immunological side effects are majorly because of those antibodies these include ige mediated anaphylaxis influenza like symptoms thrombocytopenia hemolytic anemia respiratory insufficiency acute renal failure it can even lead to it, it can be fatal in rarest of rare cases these side effects can also happen 3 months after discontinuation till the antibodies are you know uh, metabolized in the body so remember that influenza like symptoms like uh, fever headache myalgia arthralgia this can happen and with subsequent doses these two get better but remember if they are increasing or significantly problematic for the patient you may consider you know stopping rifampicin they can be severe in rare to rare cases other rare adverse events that have been noted with rifampicin is dress drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms dic disseminated intravascular coagulation pemphigus foliaceus pemphigus vulgaris have also been reported other rare cases are of sgs te and a severe lichenoid eruption a severe lichenoid drug rash is also reported with rifampicin so keep that in mind the rarest of rare uh, dermatoses can also happen with rifampicin additional adverse events include hormone effect remember that while we were discussing the contraindication slide i told you that there is increased hepatic metabolism of endogenous hormones that means when the body creates a certain level of hormones which are the endogenous hormones the metabolism of these endogenous hormones are increased because of rifampicin and that is because of induction of microsomal enzymes so it can be as severe enough to cause adrenal crisis it can be as severe enough to cause hypovitaminosis d or hypothyroidism so keep that in mind while your patient is taking this uh, rifampicin that endogenous or the uh, internal normal hormones levels might be decreased if the patient is taking rifampicin rifampicin is a known hepatotoxic drug it leads to asymptomatic transaminitis that means transient increase in trans in sgot sgpt levels these increase in levels may be permanent throughout the duration of therapy but it could be asymptomatic there will be no clinical significance but if it leads to a clinical problem you may consider stopping rifampicin if there are other hepatotoxic factors let's say your patient is taking any other hepatotoxic drugs like in tuberculosis you are also taking isoniazid which is itself a hepatotoxic drug this intensity or this tendency of it to cause liver damage might increase immunosuppression like hiv also alcohol intake Rifampicin also causes hyperbilirubinemia because it competes with the excretion of bilirubin. So, because of this competition, the excretion of bilirubin is decreased. It gets accumulated, and that causes hyperbilirubinemia. Okay, rare side effects like DVT and pulmonary thromboembolism have also been reported. So, we need to keep our minds open for that. now drug interactions i won't be i will not be discussing that in detail because the rifampicin has a lot of drug interactions just remember that rifampicin induces it increases the activity of cytochrome p450 so all the drugs which are metabolized by cytochrome enzymes group of enzymes they will have a decrease in their levels all the drugs which are 
activated by cytochrome P450 enzymes will have an increase in their action active levels. Okay. So if you have this general idea, you'll be able to easily remember. Now, calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin or oral tacrolimus, there's a loss of efficacy because the pampicin will increase the degradation of these drugs. Okay. Now, warfarin. Warfarin can have an increased risk of uh, in, in decreased levels of warfarin on the pampicin therapy. So you can have increased risk of thromboembolic disorder. And remember that DVT and pulmonary thrombosis are an additional side effects of rifampicin. So you can have an increased chance of this uh, stroke-like events or thromboembolic events. Okay, xanthine, uh, xanthine bronchodilators like theophylline, it can lead to increased bronchoconstriction because of decreased levels. Okay, so these are the drugs. You just have to remember that rifampicin increases the activity of hepatic enzymes and because of that, the drugs which are metabolized by uh, CYP group of enzymes are decreased in their action. Similarly, statins can also decrease in efficacy hormonal contraceptives. Now remember that in uh, endogenous hormones are increasingly degraded by hepatic enzymes when the patient is taking rifampicin. Same thing happens when patients are taking hormonal contraceptives which are just exogenous, exogenous hormones. Okay? So that the same thing happens to them also. So if your patient is taking uh, rifampicin, let's say a female patient is taking rifampicin, you have to advise for back uh, backup backup contraception. Okay, backup contraception. That means barrier mode of contraception or tubectomy, you know, vasectomy non-hormonal contraceptive methods because of that. So you need to advise them so that they take non-hormonal contraceptives. Okay. Lower drug interactions have been reported with the PD-5 inhibitors like sildenafil, tadalafil, which we use in system sclerosis, statins, thyroid hormones, there's loss of efficacy in interaction. So I'm not going that into detail, but just remember that the rifampicin significantly increases the hepatic activity and it has a significant drug reactions, uh, sorry, drug interactions, majorly because of its action on hepatic enzymes and also hepatotoxicity. So because of that, you can have good amount of interaction between the drugs of uh, uh, all different classes. So whenever you're prescribing rifampicin to your patient, whether they have Hansen's, whether there's any other indication that you're giving rifampicin, cutaneous TB, granuloma annular, hydronitis separativa, actinomastoma, just make sure that you go through the other drugs that the patient might be taking. Okay, ask about uh, diabetes drug, ask about antihypertensive, all of the other drugs, so that you may know that interactions can happen, check for interactions and look for any loss of efficacy of these drugs. Okay, so with that, I'll finish my discussion on rifampicin. I hope this video was helpful. I know it becomes a little bit complicated uh, learning about drugs that we don't use routinely. Rifampicin is rarely used uh, outside the purview of institutions where we treat uh, Hansen's with rifampicin. But we need to remember about this very powerful drug so that we may avoid its misuse, we may avoid its, uh, uh, you know, side effects, adverse events, and thus it remains a very safe drug to be used for the labeled indications that we have for rifampicin. Remember that in India, which suffers from uh, endemicity of tuberculosis and endemicity of leprosy right now, uh, we should not use rifampicin as a monotherapy. It leads to resistance and it will lead to further, further huge problem regarding the use of rifampicin. So make sure you always use it, use it in a combination combination of uh, uh, rifampicin with ciprofloxacin or clarithromycin have been advocated in case reports. Just make sure that do not use rifampicin as a uh, as a monotherapy. Even in prophylaxis in latent tuberculosis, there have been recommendation of using single drug rifampicin or uh, only rifampicin for at least twelve weeks. 
but i would prefer or i would strongly strongly advise using single dose sorry a uh, single drug regimen of rifampicin only it's better to use either single drug isoniazid in that cases or combine isoniazid with rifampicin okay so refrain from using only rifampicin no matter what the indication is even if the patient is 100% improving or 100% susceptible to rifampicin make sure you add one or the other drug so that the resistance problem is taken care of clear so with that i'll finish this presentation i hope it was useful you can give any comments or any doubts any other thing that you want to discuss about rifampicin any suggestions how to make this videos better any queries in the comment section of the video you can write me directly on my email and i'll answer them and uh, subsequently in the next week we will meet again and this time we'll be discussing the third and one of the most important drug in leprosy that would be clofazamine okay so next week we'll have a video on clofazamine till then enjoy your weekend adios use sunscreen and uh, let's hope this summer is over soon Bye-bye.